Welcome. I assume everybody can hear me. If you cannot, please let me know. But uh, welcome to the third Voltage <laughs> workshop. My name is Nate. I do support and education stuff at Voltage. And I'm really, 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 really happy to talk about uh, lightning liquidity, something that is scary at first but once you understand the basics it's not too bad at all we are probably going to be focusing mainly on just the basic concepts of liquidity rather than how to manipulate your node to achieve like like directly uh we if we have time we can get into that um but we're just going to sort of first talk about how like what liquidity is why it's important with lightning and then we will be sort of uh, doing some interactive exercises. So I'm really excited about that. I'm going to attempt to share my little, uh, let's see here. There we go. Cool. Hopefully that looks okay for everyone. All right. Yeah. So let's just like hop into it, I guess. Um, the way, uh, yeah, let's just hop into it. So, <laughs> so we're going to talk about a few different things. We're going to talk about what is liquidity. We're going to talk about why it's important. We're going to talk about some basic liquidity management practices. Talking about how fee rates affect that. Some external applications and services, and how this circular rebalancing thing sort of gets into uh, gets into it. Hello, everybody, saying hello. Okay, so we'll start off with the basics here. So liquidity, simple. It's just the ability for you to send and receive payments. Um, every channel has a liquidity capacity and that determines how funds can flow back and forth through the Lightning Network. So maximizing liquidity will reduce payment failures and help your nodes performance. And I probably should have rewrote that. It should be maximizing quality liquidity, right? If you open up a channel to a node that doesn't have any channels of their own, that is poorly deployed, deployed capital, right? So that's not really liquidity. Um, and it enables in-app point of sale crowdfunding integration. That shouldn't be there. Ignore that. Okay. What is outbound and inbound? So you're going to hear this a lot. So a uh, bit confusing, but uh, outbound is synonymous with local. And that simply means it is the amount of sats that you control, that you own as part of that channel's overall capacity. Inbound liquidity, also known as remote liquidity, is the opposite. It's the amount of sats that your peer controls and owns. And it is also the amount that you can receive. Um, the way that the channel looks to you will look the opposite to your peer. So um, this bottom example with the uh, 0.3 million and the 0.2 million, the 300,000 and the yeah 200,000 sets um, on my peer. So if this is my side, right? Blue is the outbound and green is the inbound. My peer will see it flipped. So where I can receive up to 300,000 sats and receive up to 200,000, it's the opposite for my peer. My peer can send 200,000 and receive 300,000. And that is the agreement between peers. Um, yeah, so we'll just talk about this real quick, sort of just to sort of wrap your head around how this is used, depending on what the goal of your node is and what the goal of your, just what your goal is. Uh, so, Merchants or folks that don't really plan on spending their sats, they're going to just want inbound liquidity. And if you are someone who's just, you know, buying gift cards or just want to uh, to to just buy stuff, um, then you will be focusing more on quality outbound liquidity. And routing node operators, those that want to focus on routing payments for others and possibly earning fees and that sort of thing, 
they'll likely want to focus on both outbound and inbound simultaneously. All right, so this is sort of a really, really simple idea of the Lightning Network, but what I want to really focus on is what is a channel. So these circles are nodes, and these black lines are channels in this, in this uh, description. So you can see how nodes and channels sort of interact. A node can have channels to multiple different peers or the same peer multiple times. It is uh, completely up to the person running it, who their peers are. Now, I just wanted to get that sort of visualization on here. And we will talk about routing payments. So uh, this is very, very important. We'll be talking about fees a little bit later. But the... Uh, the liquidity. So what's important about this is Bob here has two channels. If you just have one channel, you cannot route payments. Your liquidity cannot route payments because you have to receive from someone and then send to someone. So in Bob's case, he's got a channel with Alice and a channel with Carol. Alice is trying to pay Dan, but Alice doesn't have a channel with Dan. So Alice sends basically uh, the payment along various hops they're called so the payment hops to bob which receives it into his channel with alice and then bob sends it to carol basically and carol then uses her channel with dan to send it to dan now i want to say that um please stop me if you want some clarification on any of this by the way guys i want this to to be as interactive as possible uh so so that's that's the general concept of a lightning payment. So you could look at it like this, like maybe this red guy in the corner wants to pay, um, we'll say this blue dot up here. So the the this channel's liquidity will move from his side to this guy's side and then move from uh, his side to his side, then his side to his side, right? So all this liquidity moves. Um, and hopefully this one and this one get a routing fee for doing the payment on his behalf. Uh, okay, so question, is the one set routing fee in this graphic considered a base fee? Uh, in this example, probably uh, the base fee is one and the route and the fee rate is zero. Yeah, that's probably how this is set up on all of these, just for simplicity's sakes in this example. Yeah. Average Pub asks, in this example, do Bob and Carol both need 10,000 of inbound and outbound liquidity? Yes, they. Yes, um, both Bob and Carol need 10,000 to receive into and send from, but it's actually a little bit more than 10,000 with, with the fee. But yes, exactly. So this, um, so those two channels are each one way or the other. If that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, I can explain it a different way, but 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 you're essentially uh, correct. This is why it's important when you're running a routing node to balance your outbound and your inbound because you will facilitate these payments to the wider network in a more successful way. Okay, so let's take a closer look at a channel. Uh, I really want to hammer home the fact that the way that you see your channel, your peer sees it the completely opposite way. So in this example, we can send 500,000 sats, but we cannot receive anything. Our peer, on the other hand, can receive 500,000 sats, but cannot send anything. Um, but as this liquidity moves, that changes. If I spend 200,000 sats, now it's suddenly I can only send up to 300,000, but now my peer can receive up to 200,000. So that's pretty cool. And I just answered that. <laughs> I guess the question, if this is your only channel, are you able to receive payments? 
The answer is no, there is no inbound liquidity. This is what your channel is usually going to look like uh, fresh. If you open up a channel to up here, you will see all of your funds on your side of the channel that you used to open the channel. If this was your only channel, would you be able to route payments for others? We also just covered this a second ago. The answer is no, we need at least two channels to route payments for others. And it would need to look something like this. So this setup here, if you only had these two channels, in theory, you could route payments for others. And how that would work is a payment uh, from someone else would come in, we'll say 100,000 sats, and the first thing that would happen is this bottom channel, this actually should have been flipped, but it comes in through this green here. This will be minus 100,000. This will add 100,000. And then this one will um, move 100,000 from here to here. So you'll have 100,000 now on this uh, green side of this top channel, and you will collect your fee uh, from the movement of this side to this side. Your peer collects a fee from this side to this side. So you only get that fee when it goes from outbound to inbound. Any questions on that? Okay. So as you can imagine, inbound liquidity is, is definitely the challenge. Outbound is really easy. You just open up a channel, you got outbound, great. But the concept of inbound liquidity is you have to essentially get somebody else to uh, lock up their capital. I hate using that phrase lock up, but sort of point their capital in your direction. Now, um, but there's many ways to 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 make that happen. It's it's hard at the beginning. It can be hard at the beginning, but once you get it going, it's not too bad. Um, so they need to open up a channel to you and then you get inbound or you need to spend yours in some way, which is, you know, to shift that liquidity over. If you shift that liquidity over though, you lose, I mean, you don't lose, but that the amount that's going from outbound to inbound gets, um, spent, uh, in some direction. It can be spent directly to yourself. That's one way to do it. We'll talk about that here in a second. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about that in a second, but let's recap a little bit. What type of node runner would these channels be good for if this was their only uh, their only channels on their node? Give folks a second here. Buying stuff, exactly. The normal spender guy. This would be pretty, pretty good. Now he couldn't re receive any from his friends or whatever, but if you just want to buy some Amazon gift cards or something, perfect. Okay. And then <laughs> here's another example. What about this? What would this be pretty good for? I know it's pretty easy for now. Okay, the answer is receiving stuff or receiving payments. So uh, a merchant, coffee shop, something like that, that has some channels that look like this, it's pretty darn good because you, you can add all this together and you can receive up to that amount. Ooh, Alejandro, that um, we might have to talk about that. I'm not exactly sure. We'll we'll talk details on that one later. Uh, sorry. Um, okay, so now you know sort of like you know what um, what what you can use your node for and what the channels for those specific reasons are for. Um, so. Over the years, liquidity marketplaces have really kind of exploded. Um, one of one of them is Pool. If you're running an LND node by Lightning Labs, you can access Pool. They have a great UI through Lightning Terminal. 
this is I've talked about it before, but it's basically a way for folks that have a lot of inbound already that want to get paid by somebody who needs inbound to open up a channel with them. They can go to there and they can also go to magma. They can, I recommend using both pool and magma at the same time. So you could just get, you know, a wide range. Um, this is also good, you know, so for buying, right? If you're buying, you're trying to get inbound liquidity. And if you're selling, you basically have capital that you're willing to be paid for to open up a channel to uh, to a node, uh, someone who's running a node who's willing to pay you for that. And if you're running a node with a ton of already inbound liquidity, um, selling channels and earning a, a small fee for that could add up over time. So this is a good place for buying channels also, which is the whole point of this presentation, getting that inbound liquidity started. There's also uh, centralized sort of third parties that will that have really, really big nodes that have their own marketplaces, zero fee routing, bit refill, and a big and more. Uh, there is a pretty awesome, I'm going to bring this up actually real quick to show you guys. This is um, really, really good for, uh, so it's the PlebNet wiki. And this has an amazing list of all the different places that you can get liquidity. I'm not going to go over all of them. There are some pretty cool ones, though. I actually really like um, Lightning Network Plus. Uh, it's basic, or in the Rings of Fire group, but Lightning Network Plus, it's like you can uh, make an agreement with uh, several other peers to create sort of a, a shape. So, um, so it's like if there's three of us. I open up, a ch so if I'm like the bottom left corner of the of the triangle, right? I open a channel to the guy at the top. He opens a channel with the guy on the bottom right, and the bottom of the right opens the channel with me. Um, what this is really, really useful for is if you don't have a ton of capital, of a ton of Bitcoin, you are essentially teaming up with other nodes to share each other's liquidity uh, and share each other's channels to the wider network, which is really, really neat. So definitely uh, check out Lightning Network dot plus if if you're interested in uh that sort of thing um and that plebnet wiki page as well okay so submarine swaps we didn't talk about this so a submarine swap is pretty simple i didn't draw out a thing for it but i probably should have uh essentially you have a node that i'm sorry you have a channel that maybe looks like this okay and you really really want some inbound liquidity you can use a submarine swap service to um, move the liquidity from your outbound to the inbound. And how this works is the, the submarine swap service will send you a lightning invoice that you pay. So in this example, let's say 300,000 sats. After I pay that 300,000 sats to that service, this channel will now have 200,000 on the outbound and 300,000 on the inbound. Great, we have inbound liquidity, awesome. But where did my 300,000 sats go? Well, the liquidity service then sends you that 300,000 sats back to you on chain, minus a small fee, usually like a quarter percent or, or so, plus um, on chain fees and stuff. So that's a good way to get inbound liquidity very, very quickly. Um, very, very useful services on that. Uh, there's Loop by LND, Bolts.exchange. And uh, Danny D's got um, a cool service at DZ.io for uh, for submarine swap options. I really only recommend submarine swaps if you really need inbound quickly, right? You don't have time to negotiate with people or beg people to open up a channel with you. So you just want to open up that channel, run a submarine swap, get that inbound, and then you get it back on your um, on your on chain minus minus a fee. Um, it actually can be a quick way to bootstrap inbound liquidity on a routing node very quickly as well. Okay, it's going to take a second here and see if there's any questions. I do have somebody typing. Oh, there we go. Can different lighting implementations, L and DC lighting, open channels together? Yes. Uh, the the same uh, specification is used for these uh, 
these uh, different implementations. The only thing is anything built by um, those specific implementations that are uh, sort of services, for example, loop by LND can only be used by LND nodes. Uh, C Lightning has um, what's called liquidity ads, which is sort of their version of of loop, but that doesn't affect um, opening up channels to each other or anything like that. It just affects those tertiary services. Any other questions? All right, moving on. We're trucking along, guys. Here we go. Okay, let's talk about fees and fee rates. We're all warmed up now. Okay. So to recap, you collect a fee when you route traffic for other nodes on the network. You might not know what the origin is or what the destination is, but for some reason, the Lightning Network has decided that this payment going through your node is the best way to go which is great. Uh, I'm just gonna pause here for a second. I think we got a question coming up here. Uh, the fee you collect is from the channel that passes the payment to the next hop. We went over that. It's the ch channel that um, that your outbound is moving to your inbound. That is the, the where you collect your fees. Can you contact local merchants and set up lightning payments with them to build volume? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but um, merchants that do want to use lightning to accept payments in a non-custodial way, it's definitely uh, a really good idea to you run your own node and, and um, go through the process of acquiring that inbound liquidity. I generally advise merchants to sort of think how much volume are they expecting for a month period and trying to get at least 1.5 times that much in uh, inbound before the month starts. Now we there, if you have a really good month, you are not going to, um, you know, have to scramble for more inbound um, that way. And also that way there, you really only, I mean, you can check on it. You can move funds around, whatever but um, it doesn't require a lot of babysitting when you do that. Um, okay, so back to fees. The channel will go from outbound to inbound after the payment is routed. Um, that is the channel that you earn fees on. You'll have another channel somewhere else on your node where inbound shifts to outbound to offset that change. Okay, this is really fun. So we're gonna do a little bit of interaction here. So imagine that these three people are the only people on the entire Lightning Network for now. Um, and I hope everyone can see it. I hope it's big enough, but let's, let's go through this a little bit just to see how liquidity flows. Right. So Lindsay is over here. She has a channel with Lori. She has 2 million sats on her side because she just opened that channel with Lori. Lori doesn't have any sats on her side. How many sats can Lindsay receive? Zero, correct. Lindsay cannot receive anything yet. <laughs> this is fun. Okay. How many sats can Lori receive from Lamar? Total. If Lamar emptied his node to Lori, how much could Lori get from Lamar? 300,000 is the correct answer. So if Lamar is paying Lori, He's only got 3,000 sats to spend. Bonus question. What is the total capacity of the Lori and Lamar channel? Correct. 1 million. And it's important to know, fun fact, um, as of right now, a channel that is you know, at that point of open, whatever that initial capacity of that channel is, actually is cannot be changed. However, by but cannot be changed. I mean, like this channel Lindsay has with 2 million sats. Um, I can't just go and take 
another million and make it three million. Like that's like the total capacity. However, there's this new uh, sort of innovation called splicing that, cha that has changed this. And splicing has actually been done in the wild where you can actually add funds to an existing channel. Uh, it's really, really, really cool. So this might change uh, in the near future. Actually, it probably will change. So you will, we will be able to add uh, funds to a channel and and um, retrieve funds from a channel without closing the channel. Yeah. So that's that's called splicing. Um, okay, back to this. Uh, how many sats can Lamar receive from Lindsay? So Lamar doesn't have a channel with Lindsay, but how many can he receive? Seven hundred thousand sats, correct. And the limiting factor is this Lori here. So if Lori had um, two million sats of uh, on her side of this channel with Lamar, then Lamar could actually receive two million sats. But because of that seven hundred thousand, um, only Lamar can only receive seven hundred thousand, even if it's coming from Lindsay. It's it, same thing for Lori also. Uh, how many sats can Lori send to Lamar? Same thing. We just said it. 700,000. And how many sats can Lindsay send to Lori? Okay. You guys, you guys get it. Yep. 2 million. Exactly. Almost. <laughs> you guys are good. You guys are really, really good. So this is it. Like you guys are basically experts now. This is how liquidity moves around. And it, and it expands wider than this also. Um, oh, yeah, there's there's a great link if you guys want to check out Splices. Okay, here's all the answers. We just went over them. For those watching at home, if you want to check your work. If Lori and Lizzie had two channels, could a payment use both? Uh, yeah, actually, there are some, there are, um, there are parts of the Lightning Network called multipath payments or atomic, atomic multipayments, multipath payments that, um, actually can send one payment through multiple channels. Uh, that is active today. Yep. Ellen Sploit, yep, Ellen Sploit. That was just at TabConf. It was pretty cool. The Lightning Network is not perfect, everybody. We are still working very, very hard on it. <laughs> but um, everything that is not perfect about it can theoretically be fixed. So that's also a good thing. Okay, another fun little question from here. Let's assume some fees on this, what we just went over. If Lori routes 500,000 sats to Lamar from Lindsay, what fee will she earn if the fee rate is 10,000 PPM? PPM, for those that don't know, means parts per million, and 10,000 is 1%. This is what you use to set your fee rates on your channels. So we'll do that first question first. First. Don't overthink it. It's not too bad. Yep, 5,000 sats, correct. And those 5,000 sats, will Lori collect those from her channel with Lindsay or from her channel with Lamar? Bonus question. It's actually Lindsay. So um, Lindsay will route 500,000, will pay 500,000 and, I'm um, sorry, 505,000. So Lori's channel, when this is over with Lindsay, she'll have 505,000 sats on her side. And then she would move the 500,000 um, from her side here 
Wait, did I get that backwards? Crap, I got that backwards. I got that backwards. You're right. You're right. It is Lamar. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh gosh. See, this is why you gotta you gotta think about it a little bit. Uh, yeah, those um, it will end up um on Lori's side or with Lamar. Okay. Uh, if Lori's fee rate is ten thousand ppm, how many sats is Lindsay sending in fees on a five hundred thousand sat payment? We just said that. Um, it's just a different way to word that. And how much outbound with Lamar will Lori have after this payment? We'll do that one. So after 500,000 sats gets routed through, how many outbound sats will Lori have with Lamar? Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. All right. We're all getting sick of quizzes, I can tell. So just to recap there, um, the fee rate on Lori's outbound to Lamar is where the uh is is the fee getting paid. Um if another pay if another person was out here and routing through Lindsay and over, then they would get paid on this channel. So remember it's the outbound to inbound that gets um gets the fee payment. Any questions on that? This is probably the most confusing part of it. Uh, okay, so uh, guess what is the base fee? So, um, so a base fee is basically no matter what the size of the payment, the fee will always be a set amount. So, um, if if the base fee was five, then in this scenario, it'd be five thousand and five would be the route, the payment. How can Lori pay herself a fee from sats on her own side of the Lamar channel? Am I confusing myself right now? That's embarrassing. So, okay, so let's go back through it. Let's go back through it. Let's go back through it. Um, yeah, so... 5,000 and 500, sorry, 505,000 sets go from Lindsay to Lori and then Lori moves hers to Lamar. No, that's, that's, that's correct. That's correct. Because Lindsay's the origin because Lindsay's the origin. If Lindsay wasn't the origin, then Lindsay would collect the fee. Okay. So it's all right. So just to rewind here, because Lindsay is the origin Lori's fee collection will be on the Lindsay channel. And then this, the Lori to Lamar will be 500,000. If Lindsay was not the origin, then it would be the other way. Um, okay. All right, last topic here. What is a circular payment or rebalance? It's essentially you're paying yourself uh, when you send a payment out of one of your channels and into your own channel. This is called a circular payment or some like to call it a rebalance. You want to do it when liquidity is flowing in only one direction and you want to shift that liquidity back. So if for some reason you had two channels that had really good affinity with each other, meaning that you were routing payments for others through these two channels pretty, pretty often like into one and then out the other really often. Eventually the liquidity will get out of whack. It'll both one will go totally the outbound, one will go totally into the bound, and it'll stop flowing, right? So how do we shift that liquidity back around? Well you could pay yourself. Um so you can um let's let me see where I'm here. This is used when liquidity is flowing one direction. You want to shift liquidity back. A big reason is security balance to take advantage of payment routes that are flowing from outbound to inbound. We just said that um, be careful though, a circular balance uh, incurs lightning network fees. You are paying other hops on the network to um, to facilitate your self-payment. So it's important to have an idea if you are losing money <laughs> from doing this. So let's go through an example. If these are my channels and I'm doing a self-payment of 200,000, I'm sorry, 2 million sats to um, to sort of quote unquote rebalance these channels. 
and let's just say it costs 2000 sats in routing fees what ppm assuming zero base fee just to keep it simple um will the uh the channel that's increasing and outbound have to set where if it drains again it'll make those 2000 sats back so we're just trying to break even in this scenario in the best case scenario you would want to do a little bit more than this to try to squeak out a profit and if that's confusing just say that you're confused and that's totally cool one thousand correct um for those that don't remember ten thousand is one percent one thousand is point one percent and 2,000 is 0.1% of 2 million. So we need to set our fee rate to at least 1,000 PPM. <laughs> I don't think I have a channel that earns 1,000 sets. That is a great point. 1,000 PPM is actually pretty darn high. So you have, in this situation, you'd have to think, is it really worth spending 2,000 sets if I have to make the fee rate a thousand PPM, in this case, you might want to do some research. You can go to amboss.space and look at your peers fee, like history and stuff to try to like figure out if it's actually going to work. But if you're already routing it a lot and you know that it works at that, then, then you should be good. Um, but you can change your fee rates to try to find where that uh, equilibrium is between um, routing payments and maximizing how much you get back. I opened up a channel that's all outbound, but it hasn't routed anything for a few weeks. Should I close it? I haven't. I already have a few other channels with lots of inbound liquidity. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Uh, yeah, if, if your peer that you are connected to, um, for that outbound channel is also well connected. Like you go to amboss.space, they have 40 channels or more, maybe like they're decently connected and all your other peers that you have inbound liquidity with are also decently connected. Um, first thing I would do is try to see if there is an issue um, regarding fee rates. If your fee rates are already super low, like below 50 PPM with one base fee and it's still not doing too hot um there's a couple there there's there's quite a few little things you can look at on that actually but generally speaking though um you can either try to open up more channels uh <laughs> to try to see if um that would work but another thing you have to remember too is a lot of these nodes that have hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of channels, if you have channels with them, um, it, it's actually pretty hard to route payments because you're competing with all of their other channels. I'm a pretty strong proponent, and now we're getting into just my opinion, but I'm a strong proponent of having a good diversity of peer types on my routing node. So I'll have channels with some big nodes, some medium nodes, and some maybe smaller-ish nodes. But that's not to say that I'm going to open up channels with just any node. I'm There's still high quality medium and small size nodes out there that you can uh, look at lightning terminals, see if they have the green check marks and, and see if they have, you know, at least 30 or 40 channels is a pretty decent small node to, to, um, to open with. Now that's, that's assuming that we are trying to have a routing node though. If we're just trying to have a merchant node or we just want to spend funds that, is a totally other thing that's much, much easier usually to deal with. Does that help, Andrew, a little bit? Awesome. Awesome. I uh I hope, I hope, I hope it works out um with that. I I, I could be frustrated on that. And I have closed channels um due to that because it's frustrating, right? Like you have it could be millions of sats in this outbound channel and you want to facilitate routing payments and it's not doing anything. So you're, you have like this incentive, this thought that's like, 
do I just sit here and wait and have my capital just do nothing? Or do I close that channel, get my capital back and try a new peer with that capital, right? And it's, it's a tough call that, you know, you got to sometimes make for sure. Okay, so we went through the answer. 2,000 is 0.1% of 2 million. So the fee must be 1,000 PPM to break even when the channels become unbalanced again. Keep in mind, and a lot of people don't realize this, this is like the broken window fallacy, for those that don't know, of lightning. <laughs> um, if you do this circular rebalance, you are basically giving up any fees that you would collect from that outbound uh, channel moving um, liquidity naturally to the inbound channel because you're sort of forcing it through you're not going to earn anything from that. So just something to keep in mind. Basically, at the end of the day, always have a reason if you're going to facilitate a self-payment. Just having imbalanced channels, in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, is not should not be the only reason to do a self-payment. Um, in Thunderhub, this is where you would go. There's a, uh, on the menu on the left on Thunderhub, there is a rebalance button where you can choose the uh, channel that you want to go from outbound to inbound. And then the channel you want to go from inbound to outbound, the max fee that you're willing to pay the wider network. Um, and you could do a fixed or a target amount. So if I want to do at least 500,000 sats, I can make that a target. And then, um, you know, you can have it try for a few minutes and then click rebalance. And if it'll and it'll go through, if it'll go through, so that's on Thunderhub. Wow. Okay. I guess that is it. I feel like we got through that pretty quick, actually. Um, I really uh, uh, would love to answer any questions or try to if I can. I know it got a little bit confusing there in the middle. Yeah. So okay. So it's fun. Uh, so the broken window fallacy is a um, is like the first chapter of Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, which is basically um, if you are a barber and somebody throws a brick through your window, does that help the economy or does that hurt the economy? And uh, those that say it. Um, helps the economy would say it helps because now the glass maker has business because they can make a window. Um, but, and that's, that makes sense, right? Like whatever. But the fallacy is that those who think that it helps the economy don't realize that now the tailor is losing money because the barber was saving money that he now has to spend on a window that he was going to spend on a new suit. So the point of that is, in this in this aspect that you are basically you know losing out on whatever fees you would get uh, from the outbound inbound flow flowing just naturally by forcing that uh, if all nodes were to regularly rebalance their channels wouldn't that end up being an endless back and forth action uh, yeah, actually. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is where it gets kind of, kind of wild, right? Any channel that gets closed down with, um, all of, or most of the, uh, outbound liquidity kind of wins you, a, a channel that gets closed with all the remote, with all of your remote that gets closed. That's kind of a big loss because remote, is, like, it's not like lost financially, but it's lost, you know, your node is losing inbound liquidity. A node can never have, a, a routing node at least, can never have enough inbound liquidity. So it's always a bad day when somebody closes a channel on you with a bunch of inbound liquidity. Um, so um, anyway, where was I going with that? Um, so yeah, so uh, so essentially, if I wanted to retrieve some of my capital from my Lightning node back to an on-chain wallet, I want to close a channel that has the mo as most outbound as possible. Now, what if all of my channels are quote unquote balanced? Maybe instead of shutting down two of the channels, like let's say two channels have 2.5 mil and a 5 mil capacity channel. 
instead of closing down two channels, how about I circular rebalance as much as I can into the outbound of one of them and then close it down. So that's like a strategy that technically screws over a peer because you are extracting their inbound liquidity from them. However, the um, they can stop this or at least uh, disincentivizing it by keeping their fee rates higher. So nodes that advertise really low fee rates are really easy to take advantage of in this respect. So there's there's there is always sort of like this weird cat and mouse game sort of going on. Um, so running a routing node is, is pretty fun. Again, though, if you're just running a merchant or just want to spend, none of that pertains to you, really. I hope that made sense a little bit. Uh, Andrew says, is it possible to lose your Bitcoin that's locked in a lightning node, such as a theft or a hack? Uh, so it, I'd say a vast majority of all of the security issues that you could possibly have are likely due to negligence of the user for the most part. Like if you leave your administrative macaroon, which is like a cookie permission, on a notepad file on your desk or something and someone comes over and takes it, then they can access your node possibly or your seed words or stuff like that. Um, as far as the channel itself, if your node goes offline, something about, you know, um, the Lightning Network requires, you know, you to be online, requires your node to be online connected to the internet. If, if for some reason your node goes offline, yeah, sure, Matthias, I could do that. Um, if for some reason your node goes offline, um, in theory, I mean, yeah, I mean, okay, so we're getting into like what makes up a channel. You and your peer always have a pre signed transaction that is broadcastable to the Bitcoin network that can get you your money back, basically. This is a, called a commit transaction. And if you if your peer goes offline, you can broadcast this commit transaction and get your funds back on chain. If you go offline or if you go offline, your peer could also do that and get their funds back on chain. But your peer could also broadcast an old commit transaction from a previous state that says that they have more uh, that they own more of the channel than they actually should. And unless you you come online to contest that, then um, so like if if I broadcast a transaction from an old state because you're offline and I'm trying to get money from you, if you come back online within two weeks of of um, of that, because that that's built into the protocol, you have two weeks to come back online, um, and and you verify the timestamp of your commit transaction is after the one that I broadcasted, then a uh, sort of a justice transaction is supposed to be broadcasted where the one being cheated actually gets all of the funds. So it's a it's a it's a model to incentivize not screwing people over. Um, I have not seen this happen too much. Um, there's also things called watchtowers, which you can deploy on a server or something like that time lock delta yes that is refer that is related to the time lock delta correct and yeah you could set these uh you could set the amount of blocks basically before a force close um completes um, so anyway so that's um that's really all that can happen from the lightning side of things short of somebody like accessing your machine um, it's definitely a good idea to um, host your node somewhere where you're not going to be offline for more than two weeks at a time, though. And if you are, you um, can look into having a watchtower uh, save your commits for you. So watchtowers are these little programs that you can run on a different computer or in the cloud or something. And they actually save the, your commit transactions as they update in their database. And they're watching the network 
for anyone who broadcasts a transaction of an earlier state than that. So even if you're offline, the um, the newer one will broadcast instead. And the cool thing about Watchtower uh, programs is that um, the one who's looking to cheat you doesn't know that you are running a Watchtower. Like it's no way to know if someone you're trying to cheat is actually protected. So a lot of these incentives are for, uh, are for and, and the punishment is severe. So this generally doesn't happen because of that. Um, okay, let's talk. Uh, okay, yeah, we can talk about last week's security issue. Uh, give me two seconds here. here. Okay, so the notes I have from what happened on Sunday. So it's not too big of a deal now, but the issue was um, there's a node, a core um, a Bitcoin base layer node implementation called BTCD, which is different from Bitcoin D, um, which is um, which uh, is part of LND. And all right, I'm just going to read the notes I took because I don't want to get. So the issue was the wire parsing library that deserializes raw blocks. Um, the initial implementation of SegWit um, includes consensus level checks for witness size limits, blah, 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 blah. The BTCD's initial SegWit v1 implementation correctly updated the consensus logic, but failed to also update the defense in depth check in the wire parsing layer. So, anyway. The point is um, LND uses this library to parse blocks, right? Because a lightning node needs a Bitcoin core node or a Bitcoin base layer node to get information from. It's very important. Um, so any RPC requests to open new channels, stuff like that, didn't work for that one block because I guess we'll talk about what triggered it. Uh, a uh, really cool dude named Barack decided to broadcast a 998 of 999 multi-sig transaction that the um, that BTCD did not like. So that specific block kind of messed up the RPC stuff. It was fixed within a few hours, but that that's kind of what happened, if, if that makes any sense. Um, I guess the lesson is if you allow people to do crazy things, they will do crazy things. And I'm glad it happened, though. That was good. It's better that someone that we know and love did this than some adversary. But it just goes to show, though, that there could be like these little quirks and little little things um, out there. So definitely stay vigilant. Keep an eye on um, updates and stuff. We're still it's still early days. However, um, I believe I believe in the teams that are that are working on it personally, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, cool. Um, Matthias, does does that help a little bit? I know I kind of went a little bit technical at the beginning, but um, in general, that's that's all it was. Are there benefits of running multiple nodes for balancing your channels? Interesting. Um, yeah, so a cluster of nodes, uh, cluster, node clusters are, are used by big businesses usually. They want to have one central node that's connected to the wider network and then um, possibly other smaller nodes connected to that big one that are connected to their clients or something like that. As far as helping balance channels, that's really interesting because you could have a, a second node that maybe, or let's say your primary node, your main goal is to like rank up and become like one of the top nodes on the network um, by really um, vetting your peers and keeping an eye on your channels and all of that. It, it could be a good idea to have another node where you don't care about ranking as much, but it's sort of like a liquidity storage maybe where you can shuffle liquidity around easier, I guess, with that. Um, I haven't really done that before though, but I could see how that could be a good thing. Uh, it really it really depends on how far you're willing to go, uh, I guess, um, because 
Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, so there could be a benefit is, is my answer, depending on what your strategy is. Stu asked, did you talk about hosted channels at all? No, we just did like a basic, like what is liquidity thing, uh, Stu. We didn't really talk about any of the, a lot of the newer stuff that's coming out. Um, but uh, that is going to be an interesting development, but I will not be tackling that in this video or in this talk. <laughs> I run an Umbral which uses Tor. Does this slow down routing? Should I use another hardware for faster and better routing? Interesting. Yeah. So the Lightning Network uses um, a gossip protocol, which means that your node is constantly receiving messages from the network and, um, and also projecting messages to the network. And <laughs> nice sweatshirt. Yeah, we do not have a merch section yet. Um, hopefully soon. So keep an eye out for the voltage hoodie, possibly. Uh, so Tor is um, Tor's great. The thing is, once you're broadcasting a lot of information, and the more channels you have, the more information you're likely going to be broadcasting out there, the, the, um, the more likely that Tor cannot facilitate all that information. And your channels will, will start appearing offline even though that they're not actually offline they will start appearing offline in my experience this usually happens around like 80 channels tour starts getting kind of funky um but it's really about the amount of data going through it doesn't really have anything to do with routing per se um i mean you might not be getting as many routing hints or anything but that really depends on how many channels you have more than anything now hardware um hardware is is really interesting so uh umbral runs on a raspberry pi uh, i believe and raspberry pis are very very powerful for what you get however they are not ultra powerful i would recommend if you are running a serious routing node to consider a more serious computer um you can get some old some decent computers that will last for a long time for around 500 bucks um but I don't really have any specific recommendations on that. I personally built my own. So, but you can get like those little Dell computers or something. Uh, but yeah, also, yeah, Tor, Tor is also constantly under attack. <laughs> so there's constant DOS issues and spam attacks going on on Tor that will disrupt your lightning node occasionally. That's happened to me several times. That does not... Um, that's not affected by the channels that you have. It's just, it's just Tor. So, yep. So if you're trying to run a really top tier routing node and you really, really, really want to um, not have to deal with the Tor headaches that could possibly pop up, um, rather than you opening up your home IP address to the world, uh, you could look into using stuff like WireGuard and having proxy IP addresses that will get you that clear net benefit without doxing your location. That is a fairly technical thing, but you could look into that. Uh, is there any space to use data science on creating channels from what I saw there ain't much data to work with? So there is a concept called centrality that is pretty cool. Um, so it's not really like data science, I really don't think, but you, um, there, okay. The way I use lightning data is I use a API call from one ML. They have all of their graph data on a free, uh, API. And then there's a Python script called LNDPY tools. And you can essentially make this cool little configuration file that points to, um, uh, any public key on the network, any lightning node, it could be your own. It could be somebody else's and define some parameters. Like I only want to see people between cha 20 channels and 60 channels with this average capacity, blah, 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 blah. And you can run it and it'll show you, um, like a, a list of, uh, peers that you don't have channels with that might be good peers for you. So I really like LND PY tools. Uh, the PY stands for Python. Um, it's a command line thing though. So, you know, 
Um, but it, but it, but it's pretty cool. Automatically rebalance your channels. If you want to do automatic rebalances, Lightning Jet is pretty good. Um, I think there's another one. I forget what it's called though, but I'm familiar with Lightning Jet. I personally don't do personal rebalances unless I know I'm going to make money off of it, which is very, very rare. I would rather just, um, um, well, I guess it depends on the situation, but I personally don't really do circular rebalances very much anymore. Um, all right. I'm, I think we're going to close up shop after that. Thanks everyone for your participation. Um, I'm really happy about that. And I hope, um, we got something out of this and I hope that, uh, you all come back from the next one. We're going to get a little bit more technical down this train. I think, I think, um, we're going to soon be talking about hands-on application of what we talked about today. So you can actually do it instead of just talk about it. Um, uh, if you missed, um, any of this or any of the other two workshops that we did, we have a YouTube channel that we post them on. It's the volt. You could search like voltage Bitcoin and the YouTube channel should pop up and you can watch the other ones that we did there. Uh, I'm not sure on the topic for next month yet though. So I'm not going to announce that, but we're, we're open to suggestions. If you, uh, Oh, that's what I wanted to do. Hang on two seconds, guys, two seconds, two seconds, two seconds. I forgot something that's contact info. Um, we have a discord server. Come talk to us on discord voltage.cloud slash discord. It's probably the best spot to, um, ask a, just, just ask a question, right. Rather than having to do email and all that stuff. Um, if you don't have an account with us and you have questions for voltage, hello at voltage.cloud. If you already client with us, support at voltage.cloud. If you want to book a one-on-one -on -one call with me, you don't have to be a customer of voltage. I have open hours calendly.com slash Nate voltage that doesn't cost anything okay and with that thank you everybody i had a great time and uh y'all take care see you next time <laughs>